things happen, like I said, that we have no control over. And and when I said to you, like, why us? Someday it'll be revealed. I will tell you, you will say, I don't know why this happened, but it does reveal itself. It may not be at that moment. It may not even be a year from now. It could be a decade from now, possibly. But you do wake up and say, now I know why that was thrown at me. Yeah. Now I know why that was taken from me. Hello, you are listening to the Late Bloomer Living Podcast, where we are reimagining and redefining what it means to be in midlife, where we are gathering energy, momentum, and excitement for our next chapter via candid conversations with other midlifers about their own pivots, pitfalls, and triumphs. I'm Yvonne Marchese, your host, and I'm so happy you're here. Have you ever asked the question, why me? Or, what did I do to deserve this? There seems to be seasons in each person's life when, (laughs) well, it all goes to hell in a handbasket. None of us gets out of this life unscathed. My guest this week is Maureen Edwards. Maureen is an award-winning branding, marketing, and business strategist. She's an inventor and serial entrepreneur. And I mean, she's the real deal. She's built six companies and then sold them. If you were to see her today and what she does in business and how she runs her life, you'd think everything is great, frankly. But in June of 2021, her son was home on leave from the Marines and died in a car accident. And 30 days later, their family home burned to the ground. And yet she persists. She keeps on going. How does she do it? From what I can see, it has a little something to do with her sense of mission, purpose, and her commitment to helping and connecting with other people. I can't wait for you to hear her story. So let's dive right in. Without further ado, here's Maureen Edwards. Let's go. Hey, Maureen. Thanks so much for being with me today. Thanks, Yvonne, for having me. Oh, man. I feel like it's been a long time coming. We met in Clubhouse, and I've been on your your very cool LinkedIn interview series. Thank you so much for hosting me on that. That was fun. Oh, you were amazing. In fact, I look back and I think we talked the longest of any of my my goodness. Oh my goodness. I'm embarrassed. I'm a talker. I'm a talker. I can't help it. It was great. It was great. It took us in a lot of different places. So it was wonderful. It did. It did. And then once we turned off the recording, you and I started talking more one-on-one and I had heard you mention some things happening in Clubhouse that happened last year that sounded devastating, but I did not know the details. And when you and I talked about it, we, we, we got into it after that, in that conversation. And I just was like, whew, that's a lot. That's a lot. And yeah. I, and I've watched the way you, um, you move through the world right now and and i and i wonder how on earth you are able to so gracefully uh keep doing what you do and so so i'm gonna let you go back in in time a little bit and tell us about that and then what that's looked like since for you well 2021 was definitely not my best year it wasn't my family's best year um, you know, sometimes things, there's so much out of your control. That's, that's what you have to know in life is that the only thing you control is how am I going to react to this? And it, sometimes you don't even know that until you're in the thick of it and you take one day at a time. Yeah. But, um, last year we lost, we lost our Noah who was 21 in a tragic car accident. He was actually on leave as a Marine. Uh, for my son, my younger son's high school graduation and uh, party and festivities and and all of that and you know obviously <laughs> that that shook 
everybody's everybody's world beyond I think whatever I, I can't even tell you any more than that that's that's devastation is devastation and and you know I have a daughter and I have my son Hugh and I have my son John and each of them were hit in different ways um you know grief counseling certainly part of it yeah he was still in grief counseling um I think what added to it was 30 days later to the day our our home our family home where you know everybody grew up for the last over two decades had burned down and you know you sit by you I can't make this stuff up really it's like, like just like a, a, the ultimate <laughs> the ultimate one-two punch like, yeah. yeah how does that happen like all of Noah's skates and his hockey stick he was a hockey player and you know the things that were important were in the were gone so it's not the possessions I think everybody will say the the couch can be replaced you know it the clothes get replaced it's yeah. the sentimental stuff that your kids make for you um it's like the Christmas ornaments that you know would get a new one every year to represent the year as a family it's it's those those things that when they're gone they're gone and so that just added one other element to something being gone yeah i have been through a house fire myself um back in my 20s in my in my first marriage and uh we almost lost our our kittens in that oh. one it was pretty scary and like you said, it, it was all replaceable. Oh, we 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 got out. Nobody got hurt. Um, you know, the insurance took care of some of it, and we were happy to have the insurance because so many of the families in that apartment building didn't. Um, but you know, I I just you know to have I th I think about you know Noah's stuff and and the you know those memories that I imagine like had you if you still had them they would they would be so you know precious and uh they it are. really is those memories it's the photos it's the mm -hmm. ornaments it's the the things that are irreplaceable that's wow. i think the hardest the hardest part yeah um, so yeah we kind of got this like hit within 30 days that i wouldn't wish on anybody and and I have to say, well, sometimes I took a step back and I said, like, why us? Yeah, like if, I was, if, that was my next question. Why? Is like, how can you not ask that question, right? Like, what, at that point, it's like, why me? What, what, what did we do? Right. 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 You know, it'd be one thing to lose, you know, one on the left and one on the right, but to lose both. And, and I think the hardest, the hardest thing about it is seeing my son to so devastated to the point where he's he's not safe the safe guy anymore mm. um, super happy go lucky like the most amazing person he like radiated sunshine bluebirds lollipops he had like the most charmed life the most charmed world and to see that taken away from somebody based on tragedy and to see more of a more of an acre or an edge. I think that's that's really what's hard. Yeah, so hard. It's hard to watch your kids suffer. Yeah, you know, so you feel like I lost. I lost a lot of stuff, including his his vibrancy, his personality. It's, it's and I keep saying to him. Um, Hubie, where's my sweet Hubie? When are you coming back? He goes, I don't know if I'm coming back yet. I don't yeah. think he's ever coming back. Anymore. You know, I think this is, these are things that shape your personality in life. These are things that make you become you. And mm -hmm. they start at a young age. And we talk about where we are now in life, in midlife, but if you look back, what you're doing now was shaped a long time ago. 
mm -hmm. by different things that have happened. Absolutely. Absolutely. We make decisions as young people about ourselves and about the world and how we mesh with that and and how we work and move within that, you know. I think that's I think that's one of the things that I'm exploring with this with this podcast is how do we how do we evolve uh as we age how do we how do we get past the the part the, the decisions that we've made about ourselves that don't serve us because there's decisions we make about ourselves that absolutely serve us and then there's the ones that don't that keep us stuck in a quagmire in some way shape or form in our life right based on a decision we made in a particular point in time and then now years and years and years down the line the circumstances have changed they're different yeah and they require different things from us things happen like i said that we have no control over and and when i said to you like why us someday it'll be revealed i've never been in a situation where something tragic has not happened because this was not the first time that tragedy had hit our family so maybe when you say i handle things better than maybe you would expect i think maybe because i've had some some good practice <laughs> unfortunately i'm sorry to hear that yeah yeah unfortunately yeah. and and yet i will tell you you will say i don't know why this happened but it does reveal itself it may not be at that moment it may not even be a year from now it could be a decade from now possibly but you do wake up and say now i know why that was thrown at me yeah. now i know why that was taken from me so i wonder how did you how did you keep moving through it like did you like i just i can't even imagine well here's the thing what's the alternative you know we we talk about aging and it's like i hate my birthday right i don't want to be 60 i don't want to be 65 i don't every number is a number and then you have to say to yourself well what's the alternative mm -hmm. to not getting to 50 51 52 so I say to you, what's the alternative to not getting through every single day when you have people who are dependent on you, right? Um, both family, you know, and business-wise, you, you have a set of responsibility. And you also have a responsibility to yourself. And that responsibility is to, to say you only get one one shot here, like one, one opportunity. You can either do something amazing with it or you don't, you stay in bed all day. I'm not saying any of this is easy. Whoever decides to, to handle it the way they want to handle it, it's all, there's no judgment. It is, None. it's a uh, unique to everyone, right? And I don't think there's a right or wrong. Nope to how you handle grief, to how you handle um, change and challenges. And, uh, you know, you, you got to do what you got to do, you know? Is that your puppy? Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> my little guy over here, you know, and I, I say my, my dog is like one of my children been through you know 14 years of things with me and i i have to tell you bonnie's not doing very well so i mean he's literally on my lap the whole time and i say don't let me lose one more thing like right, right now i can't give me a little bit of of time in between before i have to process grief again right again yeah. so you know yes he is by my side so if anybody's hearing him out there I'm okay with it because um, <laughs> Me you know, we're barking memories. Otis is going to be on your podcast too. <laughs> um, so yeah, so those are the type of things I feel right now is don't give me one more thing to have to tackle. Like give me a little bit of a reprieve. But 
whose decision is that to make? Right. We don't get to decide. We only get to decide how we're going to react. You know, um, that's all we ever have any control over. It's true. And like I said, we can either not move forward or, or we can, and we, we try and make, make it impact the best way we can. Yeah. So, so I love, I love that you pointed out your responsibilities to, you know, your family. It, it really is. It really does come down to, yeah, I mean, I'm just thinking this out loud right now. When we have somebody we're responsible for, when we have something we're responsible for, sometimes that can be the thing that gets you out of bed and gets you, you know, serving somebody else, helping somebody else. There's so much power in that for what it does for us. Absolutely. It's incredible, Absolutely. right? You can, you can almost say serving others is self-serving, mm -hmm. right? Um, and if that's what you have to do, then that's, that's what you have to do. Everybody benefits. You help the others who need your help. And at the same time, you're healing yourself. So yeah. That's okay. And for me, it's to focus. Um, you know, I have, I have business clients who need me, right? But then let's focus on you right now. Let's get you to where you need to be. I have children um, who need to get to where they need to be. My daughter's getting married this year. That's, you know, mm -hmm. one thing that, um, you know, we, we are, are celebrating. Now, I, People make their own decisions in life. And, and we would have loved for Lydia to have this like huge wedding that we all think about. And with things that have happened, they have chosen to elope uh, at the Biltmore, a beautiful place. But we're not going to be there. And that's just, that's, that's hard. So it's a happy moment, yeah. but one that they wanted to personalize and, and do on their own. So of course, we're having a wonderful celebration of marriage party in December after we hopefully get in this house. Like that's another set of drama, trying to rebuild a home. Mm. But but that's, that's the goal. But I know that my daughter made a decision to do that, to take, she said, it's just gonna be weird to have family pictures when there are people missing hmm. and yeah that shapes decisions like the, things like that shape people differently and even the choice to have a type of wedding was factored into it wow it's a ripple effect that's it what really i call is, it it's a it? ripple effect wow and so we're we're celebrating the fact that she has amazing Beyonce, we've known him for years. They've been together. She's just doing great on so many levels that we're going to celebrate it. You know, that's we're just going to celebrate it differently than your traditional wedding. Yeah, does that make sense? It absolutely does. And there's an empowerment there when you when you make a decision to do something your way because of your circumstances instead of the expected way or the traditional way because that's what is done right in quotes right no stop hold the phone let's back up and and do what we need to you know what we all need to do yeah and so i want to talk a little bit about the changes in you in your business that have happened yeah. in the past year too because I have to wonder how connected all this is. Um, I, kn I know you as part of Eight Simple Steps. And then as I was doing more research to talk to you today, I was like, oh, she's she's got this. And I knew I know you have a long storied history of entrepreneurship and <laughs> and and all that. But I didn't I didn't realize that you're um, you're marketing. It's it's an agency, right? Is it Genicom, yeah. correct? Genicom, yes. And yeah. so. And then I'm like, oh, okay. So 
what is the difference between Ingenica? Why do you have two different? And I started to wonder about that. And so I'd love for you to go back and kind of tell us about the genesis of Eight Simple Steps and, and yeah. what that is. It's like I have two different personas, two yeah. different brands, right? Yeah. Well, I started my agency back in 2012. Um, it was actually my fifth company that I had created. And uh, I'm, I'm brought in as a turnaround strategist or a startup strategist or to you know rebrand an entire line of products that maybe have seen the end of their life cycle. That's, it's a do it for you, um, for you company. And I love it because it's so incredibly creative to build websites, build brands, and it's across all industries. So it, it's, it's amazing. Um, but I was teaching at the community college and this was before COVID and I would teach on branding, marketing, business strategy, digital marketing, uh, website development design. And I had all these, these courses for these small business owners and all of a sudden face to face was shut down in an instant. I mean, I think we can all relate to how quickly our lives changed mm -hmm. and it was, well, when somebody says to you, well, what are we going to do now? Like what, you're not going to be here. We've got businesses to run and it's more important than ever as, as a small business owner for us, if we're going to survive. And I said, I'll take it all online for you. We'll be able to communicate. We'll be able to keep it all going. And all of a sudden people were sending the course links to other people they knew. And it was outside of just our little place in Annapolis, Maryland, right? It, it was so localized that now it became like statewide and then region wide. And then people from all over the country were buying these courses that were only really supposed to be set up for a select group of people. Hmm. And I thought, wow, what a way to multiply my impact, which has always been to impact one small business owner a day to be able to thrive and survive and keep them in business. Um, you know, 2,739 people went out of business yesterday, today, and will tomorrow. And that's the first time entrepreneur. And I have always said, having almost lost one of my companies, I would never want that to happen, which is why I was at the community college working, giving back to the community to make sure this wasn't happening. And all of a sudden COVID hit and it was a wake up call that you can actually multiply your impact. Something so horrible like COVID came in and was able to open up the opportunity to do something so much more and so much more worldwide than I never expected it. Wow. So yeah, the evolution of Ingenicom created eight simple steps because I would, I would create all of my courses in eight simple steps for people to process. And it was also based on the goldfish syndrome. You know what that is? I have a I have an idea because I have a thing about goldfish, but you tell me I don't know it as the goldfish syndrome. So tell I mean, me you'll more see about it. you'll see my goldfish. Yeah, I know you have a goldfish yeah. logo. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's always been uh, been known that we have short attention spans, but actually, science has come back and said goldfish have the attention span of nine seconds. People have the attention span of eight seconds. So I always say we would be much more successful marketing to a goldfish than we would to each other out there. So that's one of the other reasons it's in eight simple steps, because I only have about eight seconds to really make an impact. Uh -huh. I see. I see. Yeah. That's so cool. So a lot going on in my head right now. So I'm not even sure exactly what I want to ask you other than it's making me think you had in Genicom, that was your, and, and, and years and years and years of experience. And, and you decided to give back via the community college, right? And then that, then a worldwide pandemic forced you into this change, right? And then you, you adjusted, you made your, you made your adjustments and then that blossomed. It did. And you know, I did not plan on it blossoming. I already had a job. Let's call it that. I didn't really need to create another company, did I? Mm -hmm. All right. I had already created five. I, I was perfectly happy doing my little thing. 
but opportunities can present themselves. And you have to take a step back and say, I can either run with this and see where it goes, or I could say right now, hey, not interested. The link is only for people who I know right here in Annapolis, Maryland, and call it a day. I'm probably your, your entrepreneur to heart, because if I had done that, I would have missed the opportunity to open up opportunities for others. So I had to run with it. Yeah. Did the community college not take the courses online? Is that why you had to, they just didn't? No, they didn't because we were um, in the entrepreneurship um, program with them through the Small Business Administration, through SCORE. So technically we were linked with them, but it was up to us to do it for them. They didn't have the obligation. Okay. Okay. I got you. So I see now I understand that sh how that shift happened. Yeah. Wow. 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 So we could have just ended it and just said, Maureen's not running them. Or I did what, what I felt was right for them and just pulled the courses that I taught and created the, the curriculum and the same structure and the same process that, that I had been using for years is what, what I teach them. Um, and just just brought it online for them. And this was hard for them though, Yvonne. Most of them were in their 50s, 60s, really? 70s. And technology, uh -huh. you know, they weren't born with an iPad in their crib. Oh I'm, girl, I, I, I know, yeah. I know. I, I'm learning technology every day and it's yeah. not my favorite thing in the world, I'm gonna so There say. were a lot of gaps. There was a <laughs> lot of like heartache for everybody. Like, how do I do Zoom? Like, how do I get on a dashboard? Like, so. There were a lot of things that we had to work out. With oh this. my goodness! Wow. Yeah, it, it, it was it was challenging. My question to you too is: you had your business going in the meantime. How did you come? Like, how do you find time to then go? Oh, I'll just create these extra classes and I know do in the, the recording. Cre create a platform, do the recordings. I mean, a lot. I'm sure a lot went into that. Oh, Even before huge. it grew into what it is now, I'm sure yeah. that that was, how, how did you find the time and energy? It was much easier to go to the, the class every day. Like, you know, when I, when I was doing them on the weekends, it was much easier. This was a total like, oh my gosh, I have to set up these platforms. I have to do these recordings. I have to upload all the, the materials. I have to teach myself all of this too. I didn't know about think it big or like Kajabi, all that stuff. Right. Totally foreign to me as well. Um, so it was a matter of keeping what I could together on the stuff that Ingenicom had coming in. And I had so many like website builds that I was doing in between trying to get all that other stuff up and running. So really what it was is prioritizing. What was most important? My clients who I had already secured contracts with it, they were the most important keeping things simple for the people who I had moved everything online to. It, it was a juggle, but it was prioritizing. That's yeah. how it was. Yeah. Wow. 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 I'm, I'm just, wow. <laughs> just want to bow down to you right now. It's no, you know, amazing. we don't. It's, it's, you know what my problem is? It's entrepreneurship. Once you become an entrepreneur, something happens to you. <laughs> I never wanted to be an entrepreneur. Yeah. I, I tell this to people all really? the time. Never. I was a corporate girl all the way. I loved corporate America. I loved the business suits. I loved my team. I I loved it. But I think that if you are truly, I think, an entrepreneur, sometimes it, it pushes you into it. It makes you realize that you are. And then it throws things to you and you either take it or you don't, and you somehow learn to juggle it to make it work. Wow. It just is there. When don't did you go down the road of entrepreneurship? At what point in your life did that happen? I accidentally invented a pet product. <laughs> I wasn't even in the pet industry. I'm in the pharma industry, okay? 
seriously. It, I would not recommend anybody starting a business that they don't know anything about. Okay. You so accidentally my advice on that. invented a pet product. Okay. So I, I, I'll bite on that one, Maureen. What was, the, what was the pet product that you accidentally invited? Oh, that's hilarious. Well, I invented it because my dog would wear bandanas. You know, the little tie ones. Yeah. And we always dressed him up in little bandanas. And he got caught on a tree and almost choked to death on one of these tie bandanas because a tie tightens mm -hmm. as you know it gets caught on something and you're struggling and it tightens and so i said there's got to be a better way and so i created the first ever adjustable snap on snap off pet bandana and i couldn't even sew like i don't, I don't even know how to sew a butt so for me to start a manufacturing company of sewing products right different <laughs> Who, what the heck was I thinking? And I took a huge, huge risk. Um, I leveraged everything. I leveraged my house, my 401k, my kids' education. Wow. Because that aha moment is one where you say, if I don't do this, I will regret it forever. And regret is a heck of a lot worse than fear. That is such a great question to throw in front of yourself when you're trying to make a decision about whether or not to start something, isn't it? Is like, will I regret it if I don't do it? And somebody was eventually going to invent it, right? Haven't you seen those things out there, Yvonne, where you're like, I knew about that. I thought about sure. that years ago. Of course. Of, of course. course. Yeah. We all do it. And I knew that I would be sitting there going, oh my gosh, I invented that. I had that idea in my head years ago. And somebody had more courage and became a calculated risk taker. And I didn't want, I didn't want that. I didn't want somebody, somebody to take it, knowing that I, I created it, and I'm going to be the calculator risk taker. So, so wow, this conversation is going exactly. I, I had no idea where we were going. I thought it was, it was one thing. Here we go. I'm going down another path with you, Maureen. So you loved corporate, yeah, and then you decided to leverage everything to do this. And did you did you leave corporate right away? Did, how how old were you when this happened, by the way? Well, so I asking. was 39. 39. 39. Okay. Yeah. All yeah. my career in corporate. Um, I took about six, seven months doing due diligence and market research and selling them um, at the PTA fundraisers and pop-ups and charitable. Yeah, okay. And it was my friend who sewed them for me because I couldn't sew anything. So just to get the product just right, um, it took me about seven, eight months. And um, I was at dinner in downtown Annapolis and my husband and I were walking around and all of a sudden I see this dog walking and it has one of my bandanas around its neck. And I walked up and I said, oh my gosh, what a cute little bandana. And she said, this thing's amazing. I can't believe how safe it is. We love it raving about this product that I wasn't even sure yet if I was going to do anything with, but that was the sign I needed that I'm did like, you, you know did what? you then tell her I actually <laughs> made that? Nope. Never told her. You didn't. Oh my goodness. That is Never so funny. Her. So market research right there. Just boom. I proved it. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Very yeah. cool. And then did you, did you leave corporate soon after that? I did. I left. And, what, uh, what on earth? Like, that's a huge, that is like mind boggling to me. But, I mean, I could see if you were not happy in corporate no. or if you had hit a wall of like, oh, I don't know where this is heading. I'm, I'm done with this. No, no that corporate. wasn't part of it. No, loved the company, loved the products, loved my, I had, I had great supervisors bosses i had climbed that corporate ladder and yeah no what i had on no earth idea. gave you the courage to do this <laughs> other than like if i don't do this will i regret it i mean that wow you know i say to people be a calculator risk taker don't be a risk taker you've mm -hmm. got to sit down and uh very methodically look at the pros and cons okay and, and I did. So it wasn't like I emotionally, you know, just ran right into it because there was a lot on the line yeah. to do this. 
But at the end of the day, you take 12, 13 hours a day making somebody else rich. Mm. Right? Mm -hmm. Yep. You should take a step back and say, I'm going to put that time into creating real wealth for myself and making a difference while I'm at it. And if it doesn't work out, I can go back to corporate anytime I want. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what I had to say. It was, there you go. I was you scared to death. The, yeah, I bet. I bet. I was I bet scared to were. death. I was, but like I said, regret is worse. And then you're going from being an employee in a corporation that has all the systems, all the things set up and now, and now you are everything. How was that transition? It was very isolating. It was incredibly hard from business, yeah. suits, from business suits to sweatpants mm -hmm. overnight, right? And back then, you didn't have a tribe of people. Like, we could meet people on Clubhouse, or you have all the Facebook entrepreneurship and small business groups. We didn't have that. That You were by yourself mm. trying to figure it all out. And entrepreneurship is not corporate. It is not. They are two different worlds. And it was shocking. Uh, and it's one of the reasons why I do what I do today because I never want people to be put in the situation that I was, where it was yeah. so overwhelming. I made so many mistakes. It was incredibly complex and I almost lost it all. I tell people straight out that taking that huge risk and knowing what I didn't know was not a good combination. Um, and so I do what I do today. It, it led me to what I am doing at this moment. Yeah. And I and then I have to wonder, because I'm, I'm looking at the clock and I realize we're running out of time. Um, I am wondering, getting back to the beginning of this conversation. So, so you had already taken eight simple steps. You had taken it online and it was already starting to grow beyond what it was intended to be in the beginning, right? Right. And then this tragedy happens how did that impact whether or not to keep going did you question whether or not to keep going with eight simple steps did well it's interesting because because i had a group of students in june and and i never never let on that anything happened they never even knew and then i had another whole group of students come in my small business owner students in July. And I was at my brother's pool running the course. It happened wow. on a Monday and our uh, event or our time together was on Thursday. And I never let them know that I hadn't even, I didn't even have a pair of shoes, right? I have always been able to car compartmentalize things and say, this time is for you. This time is not for me. Okay, we, we are here for you. There are not going to be any distractions because I have crises over here. And so that's, I think, what helped me was being able to identify that they were more important at that moment, that they were relying on me. They were relying on their livelihood or building their business or were turning around a struggling situation. At the end of the day, it wasn't about me. And that's, you had a sense of mission about it, it them yeah, and, and yeah. what they needed, which is yeah. just in, incredible. Because honestly, Maureen, if it, if it had been me, I probably would have been like, guys, I apologize. I'm out. And any, any one of those students would have been like, Maureen, oh my goodness, go take the time you need to go do what you need to do. And, oh, and that leads me to wonder, did it actually help you to compartmentalize, to have a part of your life that wasn't you know how you, when something happens and then er, the people who know what you've been through there's I, I don't know there's like a maybe pity fatigue or something like that does that does that resonate with you like yes. you start to you don't want to talk about it sometimes or maybe you need a break from dwelling in the grief and in that experience and maybe the time that you took to just compartmentalize and go take care of business with your agency and business with eight simple steps. Did, yep. is, that, is that how you coped? I think, oh, absolutely. 
I just threw myself into that and put them as, you know, people are doing serious stuff here. They're, they're building a business or they're having to turn around a business. You know, it's all relative, right? Everybody's got their own thing going on, their, their own hardship, their own crises, their own, you know, thing that they've got to deal with. And in this particular case, it was about them. That's what they had come to me for. So we're going to get you guys straightened out. Now, I will tell you, once the everything was over, I they were supposed to roll into my extended group mentoring program. And I told them straight out that, unfortunately, I was not going to be able to roll them into that until several months later. And it was at that point that I explained why I was not going to be able to serve them at the highest capacity after. Mm. Yeah. You know, I, I knew that I needed to regroup. And I think that it's very important that we say to ourselves that if we're not at 100%, we can't serve others. And we have to be honest with them and say, I am not going to be able to make an impact at the level that I want. Give me a few months and let's revisit this. And I said, and, and people paid for the program already. And I said, I will reimburse you and we will revisit. Nobody wanted to be reimbursed. They just came back whenever it was October or we started back up again. And they all stayed, stayed with it. I can I see why you had already proven your um, devotion and sense of mission to them. And you know, how, how could somebody not think, oh, she, she clearly, <laughs> she just needs this moment and then she'll be back and she'll, she'll be in the game. You know, there's trust. I mean, you, you created a, a trust factor with them. I, uh, wow. I just am, am completely, uh, completely blown away, <laughs> completely blown away. You know, you don't know how you'll respond, Yvonne. Don't be blown away by it. Don't be blown away by any too late. Of it. Too late. <laughs> too late. No. I am. I am. You don't know. You don't know the strength you have until you have to go through something like this. And I wouldn't want anybody to go through anything of the sort. But look at everything that causes you angst as a growing opportunity. Anything that makes you uncomfortable. Anything that's causing you the slightest bit of pain. It's actually growth. And I try to keep that mindset. And maybe I'm just in denial. I don't know. No, I'm a hundred percent with you. I mean, I, I think that is where that is where life's juice is. It's it's getting into that, you know, okay. it's finding the resilience to get through the we're all gonna suffer. We're all gonna have things thrown in our path that feel like they're too much at the time and have to like you said, what's the alternative, you know? The alternative. And I will say, though, in closing, maybe, that, you know, it's funny. You, you, you talked about, like, well, what's the alternative to turning 50, 55? The, you know, some people, it's the alternative's death, right? So, but for me, I've always been more afraid of getting old than I have of dying. I... That's another whole conversation. It is a have. whole other conversation, but it's I, where I it's where I dwell these days because I'm I'm really trying to rethink and reimagine what is possible as we age, because it, I I don't believe it's all downhill after fifty. I think that's a story we've been told, and my brain recognizes that, but my my body and my the story is so deeply ingrained through everything that we've been told our whole lives that I just, it's still there. So I'm still struggling with it. So I'm still talking about it. You know, I love how you're bringing it to people's attention that it's okay to actually grow old and grow old beautifully and gracefully. Um, but I, I will tell you, I, I don't think it's easy, but it's part of life. Yeah. So what's the, what's the, you know, alternative? That's right. really what it comes down to. Got to keep on trucking, sister. I know you have some place to be, Maureen. Thank you so much for this conversation and for, for being so open about everything and, and sharing your story with us. I, I know it's going to make a big difference for somebody Thanks. to hear this. Thanks, Yvonne, for having me. And I hope it does make a difference. And as I say to people, you can't, like I said, you can't control what's going to happen. You just can control how you react to it and just know that 
someday it will reveal itself yeah. as to why it happened. Before I let you go, how can people get in touch with you? Um, and is there anything you're excited about that's coming up? Um, you can get in touch with me at 8simplesteps.net, which is my website, especially if you're a small business owner. Um, or you can uh, email me at goldfish at 8simplesteps.net. Uh, and I'm super excited about a whole new group of entrepreneurs who I will be uh, teaching and mentoring on how to uh, how to build value in their business and uh, how to build a strong foundation of a company. And that's coming up. And that's what keeps me going is every month I bring in a new group of students who are super excited and super ready to to get down to work and make a difference in their own lives. And that's what I have to say to people out there. Embrace something that isn't all about you, but that you make an impact for others. It's a great message. Thank you, Maureen. You're welcome. Well, there you have it. I can't stop thinking about something Maureen said. Um, to paraphrase, she said, I don't know why this happened, but one day it'll be revealed. Uh, it might not be a year, it could be a decade, but you you do wake up and say, now I know why that was thrown at me. And I will say, I have found that to be true in my own life. Some of the most difficult things I've been through have helped me become stronger, taught me coping skills, and even filled me with a sense of purpose. Maureen's absolute faith that the purpose of her suffering will eventually be revealed stayed with me long beyond our conversation. In fact, it inspired me to do some reading about recovering from loss. As it turns out, Maureen's response to her loss isn't so unusual. I found an interesting article in Scientific American which pointed out that a common response is to search for an underlying significance that might make our devastation more bearable. And the process of making meaning out of misery can be beneficial, and people who make sense of their loss and even find the benefits in it experience less distress. You've probably heard of a little book <laughs> called Man's Search for Meaning, written by psychiatrist and Holocaust survivor Viktor Frankl. During his time in Auschwitz, he observed that his fellow inmates were more likely to survive the horror if they held on to a sense of meaning. Yeah. On a closing note, I'll leave you with a quote I love by Viktor Frankl. Everything can be taken from a man but one thing, the last of the human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. And after all, that is what we're talking about here in this podcast week after week, choosing our own way. If you want to know more about Maureen Edwards, I'll have that information for you in the show notes. Just go to latebloomerliving.com forward slash podcast and click on the show notes for episode 115. And while you're there, you can also find a link to sign up for a free guide called Five Steps to Your Midlife Reboot. I created the guide to help you get unstuck and choose your own way to live your life as you get older. Thanks so much for listening. I hope you have a fantastic week. Stay safe and well. Talk soon.